All right, then I guess we can begin. Welcome back to quantum field theory. Today we will discuss various processes in QED, quantum electrodynamics. And before we go to the actual processes, I want to interject a small section where we simply discuss techniques for gamma matrices because that is obviously important to do actual calculations. And uh, I will focus here only on very basic techniques for gamma matrix calculations and uh, uh, not do the full theory with, in all generality, but uh, do it in a way which is sufficient for us uh, in these weeks. All right, here I collected once again the basic properties of gamma matrices. First of all, uh, there are gamma mu matrices, which are of course the basis of uh, representation of the Lorentz group on a space of Dirac spinors. And the Clifford algebra relationship is this one. The anti-commutator between two gamma mu matrices gives two times the metric tensor times the unit matrix on spinor space. Then there is a gamma 5 matrix which anti-commutes with all the gamma mu's and gamma 5 can be constructed as the product of all gamma mu's, gamma 0 up to gamma 3. And gamma 5 square is the unit matrix and then there are a few relationships uh, for the Hermitian conjugate, um, complex conjugate and transpose of the gamma matrices. Here I only write down the one for the transpose, gamma mu transpose uh, can be obtained by this charge conjugation matrix multiplied from the left and the right with a gamma mu matrix. Okay, and with these properties you can calculate and um, help to calculate many traces which appear in actual calculations and that is what I want to focus on now. And let us start with two simple examples. And the first simple example is this one, namely the trace of two gamma matrices, gamma mu, gamma nu. How do we compute this trace? We use basically for all the traces similar ideas as we used for those contraction rules from which we derived Feynman rules. Namely, we always take one gamma matrix and commute it as much as we can to the right until we get uh, some relationship. And while we do this commutation to the right, we always pick up this anti-commutator which uh, has a known result where on the left uh, right hand side there is no gamma matrix anymore. So by using the anti-commutator, we reduce the number of matrices by two in such an expression. That is our strategy. So applying this strategy here, we do the following. We write gamma mu gamma nu as two times the metric tensor minus the opposite order. Okay. So that is an obvious equality because of the relationship. And here we now have a number times the unit matrix in the trace. So therefore, this gives simply eight times the metric tensor because the trace of the unit matrix is four, since we have four by four matrices. And uh, that is minus the trace of gamma nu, gamma mu, which is the opposite order. Good. Why does that help? Because now we can use cyclicity of the trace, which means that we can uh, take the last matrix and put it into the front because of cyclicity. And then we have here the same trace as we do on the left hand side of the equation with a minus. And therefore if we bring that trace over here, we have two times the original trace gives eight times metric tensor and therefore we can derive that actually our original trace is equal to four times the metric tensor. And then we have computed it. That is the strategy and we immediately apply the same strategy to a more complicated trace with four gamma matrices, gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma rho, gamma sigma. So we use exactly the same strategy. We take the gamma mu on the left, use the anti-commutator here, afterwards here, afterwards here. Then we get the trace with nu, rho, sigma, mu then we use cyclicity and bring the gamma mu back to the front 
and uh, obtain a similar relationship here. So if we do that, then we first have here two times the metric tensor, G mu nu, times the trace um, of gamma rho, gamma sigma, from the anti-commutator between the first two, minus the trace where the gamma mu is at the second position. Right, so here we have used the anti-commutator between the first two matrices. Next, we use the anti-commutator between gamma mu and this one to bring it to the third position. Then we have here this minus two times the metric tensor between mu and rho times the remaining trace of gamma nu, gamma sigma. Then uh, we get plus the remaining trace where we have the order gamma mu, gamma rho, gamma mu, gamma sigma. So gamma mu is at the third position now. And we have picked up two terms with a trace of two gamma matrices. Then our strategy tells us to use the anti-commutator once again, put it at the fourth position. Then we get the first two times g mu nu times the remaining trace gamma rho, gamma sigma minus two times g mu rho times the remaining trace gamma nu, gamma sigma. Then from here we get plus two times the metric tensor g mu sigma times the remaining trace of gamma nu, gamma rho. And then we get minus the final trace which is gamma nu, gamma rho, gamma sigma, gamma mu, where gamma mu is now at the last position. And then we see we can now use cyclicity, put the gamma mu at the front, and we have here the original trace with a minus. So if we put this trace here to the left-hand side of the equation, we get two times the original trace is exactly the sum of the three terms each term with a metric tensor and a trace of two gamma matrices only. So we can divide by two and then we have computed our original trace with four gamma matrices because also the traces with two gamma matrices are known. They just give the metric tensor. So the result of this trace with four gamma matrices is a combination of three terms. Each term consists of two metric tensors such that the four indices are saturated and we get plus minus um, uh, structure uh, depending on basically the permutation of the indices. So if we write down the full result here, then we get trace of these four gamma matrices is the following four. The four comes because of the trace of the unit matrix four times and then g mu nu, g rho sigma minus g mu rho, g nu sigma plus g mu sigma, g nu rho. This is how you can compute such traces and uh, that is the general strategy. You see that in the same way you can compute traces with arbitrarily many gamma matrices as long as the number is even. If the number is even, then you will always get this thing that at the final term, you get the original trace with a minus, you put it back to the left-hand side, and then you get a recursion formula where you can replace a trace with an even number of gammas by traces with two times gamma matrices less. And uh, in this way, you can get an algorithm with which you can compute all traces. And so having this in mind, let me just summarize with not so many comments anymore the most important traces. So trace of the unit matrix is of course four. Trace of product of two gamma matrices is four times the metric tensor. Trace of four gamma matrices is what we just discussed. Four times this combination.
then we can so and so on. With an arbitrary even number of gamma matrices can be computed similarly. Now the next thing is what happens if we have an odd number of gammas that is actually zero. And uh, just to give the reason, um, insert gamma five square and use cyclicity. If you insert gamma five square, uh, then you can use cyclicity, then you have gamma five, gamma five at the two opposite ends here of the trace, and then you use an odd number of times the anti-commutator of gamma mu with gamma five, and then you see that uh, the trace must be equal to minus itself because of an odd number of anti-commutation relations. And since it must be equal to minus itself, it must be actually zero. Then, um, trace of gamma five is zero. Trace of gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma five is also zero. And here you can, for example, insert gamma mu, gamma mu, contract it over mu, let's call it gamma rho, gamma rho, which is four times the unit matrix, because uh, that is equal to, it's, um, uh, so the order doesn't matter, therefore you can replace this by the anti-commutator, but the anti-commutator is the metric tensor, so you get a metric tensor G rho rho, which is four times the unit matrix. So that you can insert this four times the unit matrix into the trace and then uh, use again cyclicity and anti-commutation relations and then you see that the trace must be equal to minus itself or something like this. And uh, therefore these two traces must be zero. However, this trick does not work if you have here four gamma matrices. Gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma rho, gamma sigma, gamma five, that is actually non-zero. And so it goes on traces with uh, gamma five and more than four gamma matrices, they are in general non-zero. And then a last remark, gamma mu uh, one, gamma mu n is equal to the trace of gamma mu n, gamma mu one. Uh, so where the order is simply reversed, completely reversed order, um, use um, this C gamma mu C to the minus one is equal to minus gamma mu transpose. So if you plug in the C and C to the minus one, so you can just insert into the trace the matrix C times inverse of C, which is the unit matrix. Then you can insert this between all the gamma matrices then you see the trace is equal to the trace uh, where you replace all of them by their transpose version. Then the trace is equal to the trace of the transposed matrix and then you simply reverse the order. And uh, that of course um, is anyway only non-zero and therefore meaningful if n is even. Okay, this should be sufficient for us for the moment, um, and uh, the derivations are obvious in all these cases. So I don't know whether you have some questions to this from your experience and exercise sheet. You have seen some of those traces. So if you have some issues with them, then let me know. Yes? Yeah. So this is, uh, okay, so a more elaborate thing that would be equal to one half times G rho rho uh, plus uh, gamma rho gamma rho. Okay, so that is obviously the same thing. And then you see that here the anti-commutator 
is generated. And the anti-commutator between the two is the unit matrix times the metric tensor G rho rho. If you contract the metric tensor G rho rho, you get four, the number of space-time dimensions. That's simply the uh, trace of the metric tensor with uh, up and down index, which is just the unit matrix. Yeah, but if you have a G rho, rho with upper and lower index, that is equal to the Kronecker delta. So the trace is four. That is the reason. Okay, good. Then let us now come to physics. Let us discuss a first process in QED in some detail. So we are looking at the same process that we are looking at at the exercise sheet at the moment, where we have a fermion, anti-fermion going into a different fermion, anti-fermion pair and we discuss the process at tree level. And of course, the physical examples are electron positron going to mu plus mu minus, or the opposite, mu plus mu minus, going to electron positron. And uh, there would be many similar processes as well. Those are important processes where this process means that you take a light particle and if you have sufficiently high energy, you can create a pair of particle antiparticles of heavier rest mass. So there is a threshold, you need to surpass a certain energy threshold in order to be able to produce those. If you just surpass the energy threshold by a very little bit, then those particles will be produced more or less at rest with very small kinetic energy. And if you go to even higher energy, then you can produce these particles even with relativistic velocities. Here, that is also interesting. You take a heavy pair of particles, they collide, and of course in the collision you can uh, obtain a pair of very light particles. And so in the extreme case, even if they collide more or less at rest, uh, those final state particles will be immediately relativistically uh, high energetic. So th those are interesting processes. And in order to describe them, we need to extend QED in a trivial way to uh, contain a different type of particles. And we focus here on the plus and minus uh, two muons. And uh, the muons have the same charge as the electrons. Okay, then let us begin with our first subsection where we look at the TFI matrix element. So the scattering matrix element for this process. And for this process, there is a single Feynman diagram at tree level. And this Feynman diagram should be known to you. So it looks like this. This type of Feynman diagram so we have here in the initial state an E minus, where we have an incoming momentum P1 and spin S1. Here we have an incoming E plus. The arrow goes into the opposite direction to indicate that it is an E plus particle, but the momentum flows inside into the diagram, and we call the momentum P2 and spin S2. Then here we have a photon propagator with momentum Q, which is the sum of P1 plus P2. 
And in the final state, we have on the one hand a muon, mu minus, with outgoing momentum P3 and spin S3. And on the other hand, we have an outgoing mu plus, indicated by that reversed arrow here, with outgoing momentum P4 and spin S4. And at each vertex, momentum is conserved. So therefore, at this vertex, we learn that Q is the sum of P1 plus P2. But at that vertex, we, we learn that also Q is equal to P3 plus P4. And so obviously, the sum of the initial state and final state momenta are conserved. So this is our Feynman diagram. And our task is to compute it. It, uh, the diagram itself will immediately give us i times the TFI matrix element. And afterwards, when we want to calculate the probability, we need to square the matrix element and so on. But let us first write down the matrix element, the T matrix, which is a probability amplitude, quantum mechanically speaking. And so i times TFI, what is the value from the uh, standard Feynman rules of QED, which you now know. So we start, uh, we have two fermion lines, and for each fermion line, the rule was that we have to go against the arrow along the fermion line and write down all the Feynman rules in the appropriate order. So if we do that for the electron-positron line, then we need to start here and write down the spin or for the incoming positron, which has the value v bar of the incoming positron. And let me immediately abbreviate this with simply v bar 2, where 2 stands for the argument p2 and s2. The next Feynman rule is the one for the vertex, which is minus i e q gamma mu, where we now uh, introduce a notation that we assign a Lorentz index mu here at this vertex, and we will assign a Lorentz index nu at the other vertex. So then we have that vertex, and then we have the Feynman rule for the incoming electron, which is u1, a spinor uh, with argument p1 and s1. Then we have the Feynman rule for the photon propagator, which is minus i times g mu nu divided by q square. And then we have the Feynman rule for the muon anti-muon line. Starting against the arrow, we first have to write down the spin rule for the outgoing mu minus, which is u bar 3. Then the vertex minus i e q gamma nu now. And finally, the spin rule for mu plus, which is v4. That's all. And so to structure it, you see that we have here some term which corresponds to the electron positron line, some term or factor corresponding to the mu plus mu minus line, and the factor for the photon propagator. And so to highlight the structure even more, let us introduce some notation. We use uh, e mu. For, um, so first of all, uh, let's say TFI without the I. Uh, what is it actually? So how many I's do we have? We have here on the left hand side one I. On the right hand side we have minus I times minus I times minus I gives uh, plus I. So therefore the I and the minus is simply drop out. And when we write out P of I without I, then we can simply say that is equal to some electron stuff, E mu, times some muon stuff, M nu, times the photon propagator, P mu nu. And uh, where all these abbreviations are as follows, namely E mu for the electron is now the thing without the minus I, B bar 2, E times Q times gamma mu, times u1. For the muon mu, we have e times q 
times u bar 3 gamma nu v4 and the photon propagator p mu nu is simply g mu nu divided by q square. And so we have beautifully separated our T matrix element into the three factors corresponding to the three elements. Um, and uh, each of these elements is now essentially real up to maybe the spinors being complex valued, but it's essentially real and uh, has nice Lorentz transformation properties. And so in this form, it is um, very straightforward to discuss further what happens in the calculation. So building on that structure, we can now go to the next step. So there is not much we can evaluate here. Of course, in principle, we could put in numerical values for the speed spinors and momenta and so on, maybe in a computer. But what we will now focus on is the square of the amplitude, because the squared amplitude in quantum mechanics gives us probabilities which are physically measurable. And so let us discuss the TFI square in the unpolarized case. So, first the square. TFI, absolute value square, is simply the thing times itself complex conjugated. And using the structure, we can write it like this. Let's say we start with E mu, then E complex conjugated mu prime then times m nu, m complex conjugated nu prime, then propagator p mu nu times propagator p star mu prime nu prime. That is the uh, absolute value square. And we can introduce yet another set of abbreviations, namely this thing here is now a tensor Let's call it E mu mu prime, a tensor. And that is also a tensor, M mu mu prime. And that we leave. Okay. And so we have here introduced um, what one might call electronic tensor. And that would be the muonic tensor and so on. And we can discuss uh, those tensors individually. So what is necessary to know is now, how do you obtain the complex conjugated of such an expression? The expressions here, they involve gamma matrices and spinors. And so you need to know what is the complex conjugate of such an expression. Therefore, that is a necessary building block, for example, u bar gamma mu v complex conjugated. What is that actually? And what is it? Uh, first of all, you have to realize that uh, that object here is a complex number in general with an index mu. But uh, from that point of view, from the gamma structure point of view, star is therefore the same as a dagger because uh, it's a number, therefore transposition doesn't do anything. But if we dagger it, then of course we can write it like this, V dagger, gamma mu dagger, u bar dagger. Then we can insert gamma zeros, and then we see that this is actually the same as V bar, gamma mu, u. And so the complex conjugate of such an expression can be easily evaluated if you know um, that relationship that gamma mu dagger is connected to gamma mu by multiplying from the left and right with gamma zero. So plugging in this, uh, we then learn what is our electronic tensor, for example, E, E mu, mu prime, would be the following. So the original thing is that we have here E times Q square. Then V2 bar gamma mu 
u1 and then the complex conjugate is u1 bar gamma mu prime v2. And here we can now apply Casimir's trick where we say that actually if we have such a number we can write the number as the trace of itself but the trace is cyclic and if we use cyclicity of the trace then we can put the v2 bar at the end and we can write it as gamma mu u1 u1 bar gamma mu prime v2 v2 bar and then uh, we have here traces of 4 by 4 matrices so this object here can be regarded as a 4 by 4 matrix that object can be regarded as a 4 by 4 matrix and so here we now have a trace of a product of 4 by 4 matrices and that is a simplification because uh, it's not yet a simplification but it will become a simplification once we use that we work in the unpolarized case and we will do a summation over all the possible spins of all particles because then we know something about the sum over all spins of this exact combination here. So that is the unpolarized case. So we use for example sum over S1 of this object u1 u1 bar is equal to P1 slash plus the electron mass and so on, right? This is what we now can use and that can go into this and so therefore we have unpolarized tensors for example concrete for the electron tensor we sum over the possible spins because we do not care anymore about uh, the spin orientation of all the particles so we want to know the overall probability for any e plus e minus going into any mu plus mu minus regardless of the spin. That is the physics question that we have. And uh, okay, so therefore we do this summation over the tensor so e mu mu prime. And uh, then we can simply replace here in the trace the u u bar v v bar expressions by those completeness relations and then we obtain e times q square times the following trace here in this case gamma mu then p1 slash plus the electron mass times gamma mu prime and then p2 slash minus the electron mass that is our electronic tensor and that is now a trace of a combination of gamma matrices and uh, if you look at the trace then you see up to four gamma matrices. Gamma p slash gamma p slash is a trace of four gamma matrices but there is also the term with m square which then involves only two gamma matrices. And all these traces of course need to be evaluated. So and now um, I would say that is your exercise, right? And so if you do not see any difficulty in doing that yourself, then we can directly write down the result. Um, do you want me to do one or two intermediate steps? Somebody? No. Okay. Then uh, four comes from the trace of the unit matrix, E times Q square, and then we have the following. So we have here uh, P2 mu prime times P1 mu minus G mu mu prime P1 P2 scalar product plus P1 mu prime P2 mu minus uh, electron mass square times metric tensor G mu mu prime. So we have four terms. Why four terms? Because the thing with uh, four gamma matrices gives us three terms in the result and the term with the mass gives us just one term in the result and the trace of uh, products of three gamma matrices vanishes and therefore we get exactly those four terms here. 
So then we have calculated our spin summed electronic tensor, which is uh, now explicitly given in terms of momenta. So there are no spinors anymore, no gamma matrices anymore, only momenta, and therefore it's a quite simple expression that we could numerically evaluate easily and that we can also understand physically. And of course, the muonic tensor can be treated analogously. So here, mu mu prime uh, gets the basically the same result, only with the replacement p2 becomes p4, p1 becomes p3, and so on. And the indices mu become nu. So I just copy this. p4 nu prime, p3 nu minus g nu nu prime, p3 p4 plus p3 mu prime p4 nu minus m mu on mass square g nu nu prime. So and then we have obtained our spin summed tensors and what we then can do is we can explicitly work out the squared matrix element TFI square after summation over all the spins. So we can plug back in those results here into that product. So we get the product of uh, the muonic and the electronic tensor with the propagators, and the propagators are also uh, simply given by momenta, one over Q square times the metric tensor. So the metric tensors over there, G mu nu, they simply mean effectively that nu becomes mu and nu prime becomes nu prime, so they are contracted. And uh, therefore, the main thing that we have to do is to contract this object with that object, simply contract it. And so we get a contraction of four terms times four terms gives 16 terms, but they can obviously easily simplify it because many of the terms are equal. So there are not so many different momentum combinations which can appear in the result. Therefore, doing the contraction, so you will get, for example, one term uh, from here, P2 times P4, after nu prime becomes nu prime, right? P2 times P4 times P1 times P3. Then if you do the contraction of those two terms, you get exactly the same. P2 times P4 times P1 times P3. So those two contractions already are equal. Then you get some mixed terms that contracted with this is P2 times P3 and P1 times P4 is the opposite combination. So all sorts of scalar products appear and you have to collect and get some final result. And I will now immediately jump to the final result because uh, summing uh, these 16 terms and simplifying is not particularly deep. So I believe mm -hmm. that you can do it yourself. Therefore, I need to copy it here from my sheet. The result in four dimensions is the following, namely uh, sum over S1 up to S4 of TFI square is the following, eight times EQ to the fourth power divided by q to the fourth. That is our prefactor, and the prefactor is, uh, first of all, obvious. e times q square for each of the factors gives in combination e times q to the fourth power. And from the propagators, we get q square squared gives q to the fourth power. And the eight uh, I factored out after looking at the full result. And then from the contractions, we get the following. First of all, I use the abbreviation SIJ is the scalar product of two momenta pi dot pj to simplify the notation and then we get four times S13 S24 plus S14 S23. Those two are exactly uh, from the example that I just mentioned from the contraction of the first terms and from the second terms and the cross terms. That is exactly this. And then from all the rest, we get the following, plus two times 
the sum of the electron mass square and the muon mass square times q square. That's all. Okay, so it's not uh, particularly involved. Here, in order to see the Q square, you have to use a relationship. Let's say Q square is, of course, P1 plus P2 square. That is actually uh, the electron mass square plus two times S12 in that notation. But it's also the same as P3 plus P4 square, so it's also equal to muon mass square, uh, sorry, two. 2 times muon mass square plus 2 times S34. So you can replace Q square in two ways. And in order to see that Q square arising, you need to use both relationships for Q. Because from that expression, you will see on the one hand such a term arising, which becomes Q square. You will also see such a term arising, which also becomes Q square. And then you can collect all the Q square terms in that way. So that is the result for the spin summed um, total probability of the process. And the calculation you can do yourself. And now we can discuss some physics aspects of the result. Okay. But before discussing the physics aspects, you have the opportunity to ask me some questions. If you want me to highlight some details of the computation. Tell me. If you don't, then let us move on. So, I mean, what you need to do from going to here, from here to here, is uh, obvious, right? It's something that takes maybe 10 minutes or so, but, uh, it's actually easy. Yes. Yeah. Simply the scalar product of two momenta, pi dot pj. Scalar product. Simply scalar product, and so to abbreviate writing the full expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's uh, with Lorentz indices, it would be a pi mu times pj mu, contracted over mu. This sort of thing, which appears here. So for example, this contracted with this, after we use the metric tensors, the metric tensors make mu prime and mu prime equal, and mu and mu equal. So this uh, product of the circles gives s24 times s13 gives you exactly this expression. And uh, for example, that circle times this one gives P2 times P3 and P1 times P4. That gives exactly this expression, and so on. So from the physics point of view, it is often interesting to look at this unpolarized case where you do not care about the spins, but of course you do care about the momenta, and which tells you the angular distribution, which angles are preferred, which directions of the particles are preferred. Um, but uh, experimentally, it's often not easy to measure the spin, and therefore we sum over. And uh, of course, from quantum mechanics, you know, that if you have quantities like the spin which are in principle measurable, you must first square the amplitude and get the probability, and then you should sum over the probabilities. You must, of course, not sum the probability amplitudes. That makes no sense quantum mechanically. And so therefore, we have squared the TFI matrix element, and after squaring, we sum over all the possible spin orientations. Both initial and final state. In this case, 
I mean both initial state and final state, and therefore we have summed over all four spins. Final sometimes yes, sometimes not. It depends on the experiment. So sometimes we can control the initial state and we can polarize our E plus E minus um, pairs in the collision. It's not always possible, but sometimes it is possible. And sometimes, of course, we can measure the polarization and or the spin of the final state particles. It might not always be easy. At the LHC, it's for sure not easy but sometimes it is possible. And so in principle, you can measure the initial state spin and uh, prepare it in some spin for configuration, and in principle, you can measure the final state spin. But in practical particle physics experiments nowadays, typically, both initial state and final state, um, you don't know um, the spin orientation. And then, of course, this is not yet maybe uh, the thing that you directly compare with the experiment. What one would normally do is uh, for the initial state, of course, you know that. Um, okay, first the question. Yes? Yeah, okay, uh, maybe I'm not the best person to ask, but uh, I think at the LHC the detectors are not really optimized to measure the polarization of um, electrons. I mean, as far as I know, the electrons, uh, for example, are measured in some calorimeters where you basically measure the overall energy of the electrons by uh, them heating up, or uh, simplified speaking, um, interacting with some medium uh, where you absorb the electron and then you measure the deposited energy and so of course the information on the spin is lost in such calorie meters. For the muons, they have specific um, muon detectors um, which are at the outermost layer of the experiments because the muons travel basically through all the other detector systems. And so in principle, maybe, I don't know, uh, one might conceive uh, a measurement of the polarization of muons. However, I'm, as far as I know, it is not measured. Um, okay, uh, what uh, I wanted to say something else. Ah, okay, yes, of course, in principle, when you have this initial state beam, then uh, you know how many particles are in your beam, but you do not know which of them is polarized uh, such or in a different way. And therefore, normally one averages over the initial state spins. You do not sum over the initial state spin, but you take the average. Whereas for the final state, you are interested in the overall probability of producing any muons with any polarization. Therefore, you would sum over the uh, probabilities for all possible muon spin orientations. And so, uh, to compare with experiment, you would put a normalization factor like 1 over 4 uh, in order to um, get the average of the initial state spin orientations instead of simply the sum. But uh, we are not yet interested in comparing to experiment, therefore we do not care about such uh, factors here, but only care about the fundamental quantum mechanical um, expressions. And that is this one. Okay, let us therefore now come to a discussion um, in an explicit reference frame and that allows us in particular to look at the energy dependence. So we draw a picture. The actual physics situation looks like this. You have a um, collision of two beams of particles, E plus E minus, and we look at the collision in the center of mass frame, which is uh, typical also for collider experiments like uh, LHC or a similar E plus E minus collider experiments, where the center of mass system is identical to the laboratory system. And then you have a final state mu minus mu plus. And uh, of course, um, the collision happens head on. That means uh, the beams are on one uh, one dimensional line. 
The final state uh, particles, they also, because of momentum conservation, the momenta have to add up to zero, therefore they are also um, exactly on a one-dimensional line here. And therefore all the four particles are in one single plane. They are in one plane and uh, without loss of generality, we can simply consider the x, z plane uh, where the y coordinate is zero and then we have here one angle theta which describes our collision and the final state and the angle theta is measured from the electron direction compared to the muon direction. Okay. Electron and muon with the same charge, they have an angle theta. If theta is zero then it simply means that the electron gets converted into a muon and the direction is unchanged. If theta is 180 degrees, then the muon goes into the opposite direction, whereas the anti-muon travels in the same direction as the original electron. So let us um, write down explicit uh, variables for this situation. Then we would have P1 and P2 for the electron and positron. They have the same energy in the center of mass system. And let's say the momentum is oriented in the Z direction. So x and y are zero, and then in z direction we have plus or minus a variable p, simply p without index. That is then uh, the momentum, spatial momentum of the e plus e minus pair. And uh, the total momentum is zero because we are in the center of mass frame. And so this three-dimensional momentum uh, can then also be called p vector with plus minus, which is this momentum vector oriented in z direction. Then for the final state, p3 and p4, the final state energy must be the same as the initial state energy, therefore uh, the energy is the same, E. And uh, now we allow for this angle theta in the x, z plane, so therefore we write it like this. Um, let's say plus or minus p vector prime, where this p vector prime is the following three-dimensional momentum. Namely here we have sine theta uh, times p prime comma zero comma p prime times cosine theta. Then we have implemented that the angle is theta and we have also implemented that the overall magnitude of the momentum changes, p prime versus p, because of course the muon has a different rest mass. Therefore, if the energy is the same, the spatial momentum must have a different magnitude, namely smaller than for the electron. And the plus minus implements that they also fly head on, back to back. Then what else do we have? Our variable Q square, which is important, uh, is the actual uh, center of mass energy squared. Q square is P1 plus P2 square, which is the center of mass energy square. In this case, it is simply four times E square. Then our variable S13, what is our variable S13 and uh, then also S14 which appears in the result, the scalar product of the momentum P1 dot P3. So this scalar product is first of all the energy um, product E square um, minus the product of the spatial momenta which we can write with uh, three vectors P times P prime vector Um, but we could also write it explicitly, e square minus p times p prime without vector times cosine theta. That is the scalar product of those two vectors here. And actually, that is the same as the product S24. S13 is the same as S24 because uh, P1 and P2, they differ only by the sign in the momentum, P3, P4 as well. Therefore, the product remains the same because the different sign appears squared 
And so S24 is the same as S13, namely that. Then S14 is not the same. S14 is a P1 with plus P here, dot P4 with minus P there. So that means now the sign is changed and we get E square plus this P times P prime vector or E square plus P P prime cosine theta. And that is however the same as S23. And so that means we have now explicitly evaluated all our variables that appear in the full result. And we can plug that in. And once we plug it in, we obtain an expression for our unpolarized squared matrix element in terms of explicit energies, momenta, and angles. And that we can interpret physically. But before we do that, I have to exchange the battery. Okay. Okay, so what happens if we plug in uh, those expressions into the result at the top? Uh, well, it simplifies in many ways. First of all, we have already seen that these two variables, they are actually equal. So we get the square of one variable plus the square of the other variable. And the square is, of course, square of that thing plus square of that thing. Some terms will also cancel out. Namely, the mixed term will cancel out. And then we have here this with Q square. Q square is simply the energy square up to a factor. And here also Q to the four gives energy to the fourth up to a prefactor. And so the result is going to be quite simple and straightforward. So the spin summed TFI square is now the following. 8 EQ to the fourth power divided by 2 E to the 4. And then times, let's write it like this, times E to the 4 plus the scalar product of P times P prime vector square plus E square times the sum of the mass squares. Okay. And so I already canceled some prefactor because initially in the Q to the four in the denominator, you have 16 times energy square. And in the numerator, you have all those prefactors two and four you can cancel them against the 16 to obtain the two here. And then in the bracket, we have uh, simpler prefactors. And then as we already saw from this first term, S13 square, S14 square, we get this e to the four and the scalar product uh, squared. The mixed term drops out and the last term immediately gives us this. So it's directly possible to understand it. So and this is now our still general result, um, only specialized to the reference frame, um, but it's valid for all energies and all angles. And let me now make a small remark on cross sections. So there is the notion of a differential cross section, the sigma by the omega, which is a quantity which is nice because essentially it captures the physics of the squared matrix element, which is the probability. But uh, this squared matrix element, for example, still depends on the normalization of the states, which are of course kind of arbitrary. And in particular here, we have used plane wave states, momentum eigenstates, which are actually not normalized. 
uh, they are, have infinite norm. And so therefore, to make it really physically measurable, we should divide out by the norm, and uh, the cross-section is the appropriate quantity to do that in a well-defined way. And uh, then let me just um, write what the result becomes. You get a proportionality factor, which is not of our concern right now in quantum field theory. That would be particle physics or particle theory. So let's not do that. We get a center of mass energy, square in general, times the final state momentum, or let's see, say here specifically p prime vector divided by p vector times the squared matrix element. That are the essential factors up to some additional numerical factors which are not essential. But um, from the definition of the cross-section, what is essential is that you get this 1 over energy square as a prefactor, and you get this, uh, what is called a phase space factor, the uh, final state momentum divided by the initial state momentum. So let's say that is from the definition of sigma. And you know that uh, cross-section has the unit of an area and area means 1 over energy square in our units. So that gives us this unit of area. And then here we have uh, that. This is the phase space factor. And so what that means is that if the momentum of the final state particle is very, very small, then the phase space for the final state particle is also small. And you uh, have a reduced probability because of the smallness of phase space. And so that um, is encapsulated in that numerator here. However, if the uh, final state momentum is very big, you have a lot of phase space available. And then, of course, this factor increases. And that is the fundamental QED prediction. which we are, of course, particularly interested in. But, of course, uh, for the physical comparison, those factors here matter as well. So now we have calculated our fundamental QED prediction, and we can discuss it and potentially use also those other factors in the discussion. We will look at two limits at the high energy limit and the low energy limit and do some interesting physics discussion for both limits. And let us start with the high energy limit of this process. So what happens in the high energy limit? Uh, or is there a question? Calculational stuff or? Yeah, I mean, this factor here. Okay, I mean, that will now be our discussion, right? Uh, we are now look at the high energy limit and see what the factors do. And uh, so we come back to it. But actually, your intuition is kind of wrong. The cross-sections do not rise with energy. Instead, they fall with energy. And that simply comes from dimensional arguments. If you know that the cross-section has the unit of 1 over energy square, in other words, units of an area, and if you know absolutely nothing else, if your process depends only on energy, then there is no other way. Then the cross-section must reduce by 1 over energy square. There's no other dependence can arise. And that is the normal situation, which will now also appear. So let us look at it. So you have already raised very interesting and important questions. But in the high energy limit, we can discuss, first of all, what is actually um, a good approximation. High energy means that the energy is much heavier than the two masses of all the involved particles. And so all particles are ultra-relativistic, so they all basically move at the speed of light. Their rest masses can be neglected. The energy is extremely large. And therefore, also the absolute value of the momentum P is approximately equal to the energy, since the rest mass can be neglected, and also equal to the final state momentum. 
so the muon momentum, the electron momentum, and the energy, they are all essentially equal. And that scalar product, p dot p prime, um, um, is then e square times cosine theta. Right? So the scalar product of the two spatial momenta is just uh, the magnitude of the momenta times cosine, but the magnitude is e. So that is now the approximation that we can plug in. And once we plug it in, then of course you see that everywhere there appears um, e to the fourth power. So in, in the square brackets, here you get e to the four, e to the four times cosine squared. And that is only e to the second times rest mass that can be neglected. That is negligible. So we drop that. And those two terms are of equal importance one with prefactor one and the other one with prefactor cosine square. And then this happens, namely the energy drops out completely. One over e to the four times e to the four drops out completely. So in the QED part of the expression, there is no energy dependence anymore. The QED part is dimensionless and therefore it becomes independent of the energy. It becomes a constant. And then the energy dependence of the cross section comes from here. So, but the QED prediction is then the following for the differential cross section up to unimportant factors, which are only important for particle physics. We get one over E square, and the phase space factor becomes one. It becomes one because the initial and final state momenta are also equal, so we just get one over E square, and then the uh, e times q to the fourth power times, um, times four. The energy otherwise drops out and then in our square bracket we only have one plus cosine square theta. So, and then I stress again, the one over e square simply comes from the definition of the cross section and it co reflects the unit of an area. And the rest here is the QED prediction, which is dimensionless. And what does the QED prediction tell us? It tells us the non-trivial angular dependence. What probability do we get for the different angles? This is what the QED calculation tells us now and this is the answer. This is the angular dependence and uh, the relative probabilities of the various angles that can appear in the process. That is what we obtain here from our calculation. So uh, this is the only energy dependence. And I stress again, you could have guessed that just from dimensional analysis. In other words, by looking at the units of all the quantities, uh, there is no other, other dimensionful quantity in the problem except for the energy and therefore the cross-section must behave like one over e square. And so it drops, it does not increase, it goes to zero in this way. And that thing here, the uh, angular dependence, that is from our QED calculation. Okay, so that is a nice result. And we can now also ask ourselves, um, is there some physical reason for this angular dependence? So it's not isotropic. Uh, the angle matters. Not all angles are equal. Uh, but the probability is always non-zero. Uh, it does not happen that the probability goes to zero for a particular angle, so all angles are possible. But certain angles are preferred, namely the ones where theta is either zero or 180 degree. Those two angles are preferred. And so we might wonder why is that? And is there maybe some explanation of that? And actually there is and we will come to it. So we will discuss it. And uh, angular dependencies, of course, have to do with angular momentum and spin. And so in order to understand this, 
we will analyze the spin and angular momentum dependence of our results and of the final and initial states. But not now, we will do that in another section. But for now we record that uh, we have analyzed and obtained the full result here in the high energy limit. So, low energy limit. Um, so we need a little bit more space for the low energy limit. Or maybe not, let's try to do it here. So what do we mean by low energy limit? Now um, we have to um, acknowledge that the electron is much lighter than the muon. This comes now into play. It was not important over there, but now it's important we um, concretely consider the process where we have in the initial state electrons which are light, in the final state we, we, are heavy, we have heavy muons, and therefore in the low energy limit the muons are produced basically at rest or with very small kinetic energy. But the electrons, uh, they must still have very high energy in order to produce the muons. Therefore, uh, we can still neglect the electron mass, and as a good simplification, we set the electron mass to zero here in this analysis. But uh, we say that the overall energy is approximately equal to the muon rest mass, and so that uh, then tells us that the muons are produced more or less at rest. They are approximately at rest. So, and then you know that actually uh, the more precise version of the energy is this, namely we have the muon rest mass plus a non-relativistic approximation p prime square for the muon, the muon momentum square divided by two times the muon mass. That is of course the non-relativistic kinetic energy relationship, right? And that is a good approximation if the muons have small non-relativistic momentum. And so there would be higher order terms which are neglected. And that is also the same as uh, the simple thing, muon mass times the velocity divided by two. And so I call now V prime the velocity of the muon. Let's say velocity V prime, which is much smaller than one, in other words, much smaller than the speed of light. So then this is our expression for the energy. And then the other expression that we need is the scalar product of our two momenta. Momentum of the electron dot momentum of the muon, p dot p prime. And uh, so for the muon momentum, uh, for the, sorry, for the electron momentum, the magnitude is still the energy because the rest mass of the electron has been neglected. And for the muon, we have this uh, magnitude p vector prime square and then times cosine theta. So and this is of course the same as e square. The momentum is given by energy times velocity times v prime times cosine theta. So the momentum is given by velocity times rest mass non-relativistically, but the rest mass is approximately equal to the energy. So therefore, to first approximation, that is equal to energy times velocity. And then we have all our variables and we can plug in again into our initial formula, which is still at the top of the blackboard over there. And then we obtain the following. d sigma by the omega is, so now, uh, 1 over e square times uh, that phase space factor p prime over p. p prime over p, what is this? That is now the um, momentum of the muon, which is energy times velocity divided by the energy. So this is just the velocity times v prime. That is the phase space factor. So our phase space factor is now not one, 
but it's the velocity, and the velocity is by definition small. Then we have, what else do we have? Four times eq to the fourth power. And then our square bracket is now the following. So e to the fourth drops out again, and then we have from, from the first term we have one. From the third term we have e square times the muon mass square. E squared times muon mass square is also e to the fourth power approximately because the muon mass is equal to the elect uh, energy. The electron mass drops out and so therefore we get two times e to the four from both terms and e to the four drops out. And then we have the scalar product p dot p prime square. p dot p prime is also e to the fourth times velocity square times cosine square. So we have plus uh, a term proportional velocity square times um, cosine square theta. So let's not worry about the prefecture. So now I want to get a little bit of space, not much, but let me just remove this here. So, the square bracket. To first approximation or to zeroth approximation in the velocity, the square bracket is two. The velocity is very small, so to a very good approximation, the square bracket is simply two. Two means independent of the angle. So now we have an isotropic production of mu plus mu minus. The angle doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to a very good approximation because the velocity terms are suppressed and only uh, the velocity dependent terms depend on the angle. So, and uh, the angle independent term is actually non-zero and therefore we have uh, to a good approximation uh, isotropic production. So we have approximately constant independent of the angle. So and now a little bit more general remark. We could in principle expand this cross section in spherical harmonics or Legendre polynomials PL of cosine theta and maybe you remember doing this sort of thing in quantum mechanics too, where we also discussed scattering. And uh, one good way to discuss and analyze scattering was to expand in terms of spherical harmonics, or if we are in a plane, uh, only the Legendre polynomials are sufficient. They form a basis of all functions depending on the angle, a very useful basis which is organized according to angular momentum, or higher and higher angular momentum. So if you do this expansion here, then you see that the square bracket has immediately actually this form. It has a form with a constant which corresponds to L equal zero, and it has a term with L equal two. There is uh, apparently no term with L equal one, but there is a term with L equal two, and the L equal two term happens to have a prefactor V prime square, so the L equal two term is suppressed with a velocity square. So, and that is actually clear. Why is that clear? It is clear from the initial expression, because in the initial expression, we have a function of P prime, the vector P prime. So the velocity only enters the whole result via the variable p prime. But the variable p prime, uh, sorry, uh, the variable p prime depends on the velocity and on the angle simultaneously. Therefore it is clear uh, from that structure and also from this structure that the velocity and the cosine theta appear always with the same power. Um, the fundamental dependence is on p dot p prime, which is then proportional to v prime times cosine theta. 
Therefore, PL cosine theta is suppressed by B prime to the power n in general. And here, of course, uh, it's a polynomial, so it stops at L equal 2. But in general, you would uh, immediately know that the higher Ls, the more complicated angular dependence is suppressed by higher and higher powers of the velocity. And uh, therefore, if you're interested in the dominant effect, you should ask yourself, what is the lowest L that appears in the result with a non-zero coefficient? And here it happens that L equals zero already appears with a non-vanishing coefficient, and therefore, to a good approximation, the angular dependence is a constant. From lowest non-vanishing L, and here, that is L equals zero. And since we have here a non-vanishing contribution with L equals zero, we call that S-wave scattering. So to a good approximation, we can approximate everything with the L equals zero term, and which has the name S-wave for whatever reason, and therefore this is S-wave scattering. And so now you can imagine that there could also be something like P-wave scattering where the lowest L somehow vanishes, maybe for some symmetry reasons, and then the dominant effect would come from the first non-vanishing L, which might be L equal 2 in this case, and then the angular dependence would come from the Legendre polynomial uh, with L equal 2. And so in this way, uh, you see that it's actually a kind of useful and neat to approximate or expand such cross-sections in terms of uh, these angular dependent functions uh, in order to get a deeper understanding of what happens. And here the understanding tells us that we do have S-wave scattering, so there is no preferred angle. The angular dependence is trivial and a constant. Okay, very good. So now, that's it, we have five more minutes, and in these five more minutes you can either ask a question, or I summarize the whole thing once again, or we start a new topic. Yes, please. Uh, the um, probability, yes, yes. Uh, the zero does not come from the probability amplitude uh, that cannot uh, know this, but it comes from the phase space here. The phase space will go to zero. If you are below the threshold, then the phase space factor is identically zero. And another way uh, where how this would become zero is with a momentum conserving delta function, which is not part of the expression because we have factored it out but the momentum conserving delta function cannot be fulfilled if you are below the threshold, because then uh, the final state energy must always be above the muon mass twice, whereas the initial state energy is below it, and therefore the delta function would be zero. Therefore, the delta function is the reason within the matrix element calculation to make it zero, and uh, then there would also be a zero coming from the phase space. But this expression here is analytic. It's an analytic function of the momenta and energy. And as you know from uh, function theory, if you have an analytic function which is non-zero for some values of energy and momenta, it cannot be zero below a certain threshold. I mean, it's analytic, therefore it will not vanish anywhere. Yeah, if you say P prime is imaginary, then of course you have uh, evaluated that momentum conserving delta function, and therefore you would say it's imaginary, and so the expression then becomes meaningless. But if you simply say, I regard this as a function of energy, P and P prime, for some values of those three variables, then the expression is analytic in all three variables, and you do not see uh, that it corresponds to a kinematically impossible process.
that is right. So uh, that is the delta function. The delta function makes it vanish. Okay, uh, plus the requirement that the momenta are real. So the momenta must be real and therefore the delta function has to vanish. It vanishes. Other questions? Here, uh, the result will receive some further terms with a more complicated dependence on all variables, but I do not know uh, by heart how the terms look like. But of course, uh, there are, first of all, more complicated functions of the angle, which could be expanded. So then in the higher order terms, maybe the expansion is not only a polynomial, but you will get more complicated functions of the angle. We are still, however, that argument holds uh, that I made. Um, and otherwise, there will be also more complicated functions appearing. For example, there can be often logarithms of uh, certain quantities in higher order results. Logarithms of e squared divided by something else, maybe logarithm of e squared divided by the Myanmar square, such terms can appear. This is a typical feature of higher orders in um, quantum field theory. And so the analytical structure of the result changes. And otherwise, simply, of course, all the coefficients will be modified by terms of higher order in the coupling, because perturbation theory is a power series expansion in the coupling constant, and so all coefficients might get uh, perturbative higher order corrections. And such new features will appear. Yes, that is what I mean. So of course, uh, it will remain the case that the result can be expressed in terms of those variables, because these are the only variables in our theory. And for example, for the low energy case, uh, the same argument remains true, namely that the uh, result can depend uh, only on that combination here and therefore uh, maybe now uh, the cosine will even appear in a logarithm, but you can then do a Taylor expansion of the logarithm around some um, value and then you have this connection between the velocity and the cosine theta terms also at higher orders. No, I mean, of course, it's optional, but you can see maybe in this way um, uh, the structure of the result or the feature, and you can analyze a sort of S wave, P wave scattering, and you can label different processes with these names in order to get a more intuitive picture of what happens. But of course, the result is what it is, and so you do not need to expand it in order to see. So here you see this constant behavior, but I wanted to point out the relationship between this and uh, what we did in quantum mechanics too, because sometimes you see indeed simply the statement, ah, oh, this process involves only P wave scattering and the S wave part is zero, and then you know what that means, then for example the two would be absent, and then you might have only a cosine square dependence, and if that is true, uh, you know that the um, cross section, the probability, is much, much smaller, right? The probability is much, much smaller because at threshold you do not start with a constant, but you start with velocity square, which is at threshold it is zero. You have a much, much uh, weaker rise of the cross-section above threshold. And that is, for example, important for dark matter phenomenology because uh, in dark matter you have different candidate particles which could form the dark matter in the universe and the dark matter must annihilate in the early universe in order to, let's say, uh, bring the relic density down to, to the value which is observed today. And therefore you need a cross-section for the annihilation of dark matter and various candidates have exactly this feature. Either they do have S-wave scattering or they only have this P-wave scattering 
And those dark matter candidates where you have S wave scattering, they have, uh, so dark matter is non-relativistic, like planets and stars in the universe, so dark matter particles collide with very small speed. Um, and if the constant term is missing, the collision probability is extremely small. And so dark matter particle candidates where uh, this S wave part is missing, you have a difficulty in explaining why the relic density uh, reaches the value that we see. Whereas for if you have this S wave scattering, the cross section for dark matter annihilation is much higher and so that helps in explaining the dark matter relic density. So this sort of thing is for example often discussed in the literature, therefore it's an interesting and important discussion. Okay, no, no, I mean, you're right. I mean, the Lechandre polynomials, they have this uh, sort of, they are polynomial constant plus cosine plus cosine square. The main thing is always the highest power is, of course, L. So you, uh, each Lechandre polynomial of some L gives you a certain angular dependence, and the intuitive picture is always that if you look at the polynomial with number L, and you do, you, you, you vary the angle, you go in a circle once, then you have L maxima and minima of your angular dependence. So the higher the L, the more weakly your angular dependence becomes. That is the intuitive picture. And so the constant doesn't really matter, doesn't disturb this thing. Anyway, the higher powers are suppressed by V square. That is the point. That is the point. So only if you have this S wave scattering and L equals zero appears, uh, you have this constant non-velocity suppressed additive piece here in the cross section. Okay, then let us go on tomorrow. By the way, just in order to avoid confusion, tomorrow there will be a lecture. I don't know whether it was planned like this, but uh, anyway, tomorrow there will be a lecture. Good, and then we will uh, look at the spin dependence of this whole thing. So see you then.